To finish, what I'd like to do is to um, read some um, interesting um, tributes to um, Eliot and his quartets, um, and then uh, listen to Eliot reading the last movement of the final quartet. Um, and what I'd like you to do is to try to hear uh, some of this sense of form, structure, and pattern, um, which is what makes the quartet so wonderful. Stravinsky, uh, the composer, described Eliot, and I quote, not only as a great sorcerer of words, but as the very key keeper of the language. McLuhan, another critic of Eliot's, um, writes, to purify the dialect of the tribe and to open the doors of perception by discovering a host of new poetic themes and rhythms was the especial achievement of T.S. Eliot. He gave us back our language enlivened and refreshed by new contacts with many other tongues. And here, McLuhan's referring to the lines in Little Gidding, um, since our common concern was speech, and speech impelled us to purify the dialect of the tribe and urge the mind to aftersight and foresight, let me disclose the gifts reserved for age to set a crown upon your lifetime's effort. And of course, that crown um, reappears at the end of Little Gidding. Uh, Frank Commode um, talks about the way in which Eliot presents us with, with a pattern which, and I quote, the poet retreats into. But the poem is a great poem because it will not force us to follow him. It makes us wiser without committing us. It joins the mix of our own minds. It joins the mix of our own minds. And this, is, this ties in with the points I was making earlier about these gaps and ellipsis and the way in which a great poem engages us in a creative activity. It doesn't simply tell us something. It makes us wiser without committing us. It joins the mix of our own minds, but it does not tell us what to believe. The poem resists an imposed order. It is part of its greatness that it can do so. Rajan writes, another of Eliot's critics, the birth of meaning takes place in a manner both creative and ancient. Poetry cannot report the event. It must be the event lived through in a form that can speak about itself while remaining wholly itself. This is a feat at least as difficult as it sounds. And if the poem succeeds in it, it is because however much it remembers previous deaths by drowning, it creates its own life against its own thrust of questioning. But I think Alvarez, in a book called The School of Dunn, um, uh, and who calls Eliot a supreme interpreter of meditated experience, provides perhaps the most lucid analysis of Eliot's method. He says, the moments of greatest intensity have, as Eliot presents them, a certain obliqueness, an elusiveness, a controlling detachment. It's a poetry apart. He is, in some ways, a meditative poet. But this does not mean a poet who deals in abstractions. Well, he does to some degree. Um, Eliot's meditations are meditations on experience in which the abstractions belong as much as the images. They are all a part of his particular cast of mind, the meaning he gives to past experience. His direct affirmations are always summings up of his style, concentrations for which the rest of his verse appears as so many hints. And finally, at moments when four quartets truly baffle us, I think we can be comforted by Dame Helen Gardner, who was another great Eliot critic. And she wrote, it is better in reading poetry of this kind to trouble too little about the meaning than to trouble too much. If there are passages whose meaning seems elusive, where we feel we're missing the point, we should read on, preferably aloud. We must find the meaning in the reading. <laughs> 